Okay. Uh, we'll also plot a quantity called entropy coming up in a little bit here shortly. Uh, for the, oh, and quality. Quality can also be one that, that might be useful. Uh, other than that, you might not want to have anything else in the arrays table. Uh, especially Q and W. Really don't have any place in the arrays table. Why not? Remember the arrays table, generally, as we've used it, comes out to be uh, uh, something like, uh, I, I, I don't even remember offhand which direction we, which direction it lays, but it'll be based upon particular state points, places where we've been able to successfully apply the state postulate, identify the state point, and from that get any other variables we want. It doesn't mean we want all of them. But we might then have the temperature given at particular state points and so on with uh, pressure and volume. Those are the ones we've used so far. A couple of you on your homework uh, this week had Q and uh, W in for a couple state points in, in the array table. Uh, why is that not appropriate? For a table based on state points. What? They're a change in quantity, like there's. It's, that's exactly it. Remember the the these values are all values that we can establish at one single point. Those are what I called, if you remember, point functions. These were all functions that we could identify at a single point, and from those, we could then always have things like delta t, which was t at a single point minus t at one other single point. Whereas these are not point functions. I called them path functions, because that depends upon the entire not just the endpoints, but the entire path in between those two endpoints, especially work, if you remember, that was the integral under the pressure volume diagram. So it makes no sense to have work and quality appearing at a single point. Now, I know that's not what anybody attended. Uh, remember how to get into an array tables with any value? how to put an ease variable and tell that ease variable to be in the array table. Remember how to do it? Yeah, the square brackets. So all of these things would have been something like T1 equals what I know, 100 there. You do something like that and it automatically puts it in an array table. Some of you then also did that with Q or W and you were saying Q between 1 and 2. But what uh, E's thought was then you have a state point 12. So it actually put it way down at the end of the table. Actually, if I remember now, the state points are this way and the values are that way. But the idea is there. Um, and then left up all the ones between, I think it was 3 and 12 blank, and then did a column for 12. So your intent was clear, but this kind of thing should not appear as if it might be a state point variable. They use an underscore instead. Of so just, just use an underscore Maybe a subscript. instead. And it might, even for Q, just to make it a little more clear if you wish, that it's from one point to another. Uh, if you do this, you get that, which is perfectly fine. But if you want something a little more than that, you can do Q1 underscore underscore 2, and you'll get 1 comma 2. Maybe that'll look a little more clear to you. Now, uh, in the formatted uh, equations, the underscore and the brackets don't look any different. The, under, the brackets puts it in the array table, 
but then formats it as a subscript just like the uh, underscore does. So you won't see any difference in the formatted uh, form of these two pot, these two versions, but uh, what happens to those is very different. One's written with an underscore go into the solutions window. One's written like that go into the array table. Even if you don't use the array table, that's where they go. So in practice, probably nothing else but these should go on the array table. All right, so that's what was on uh, common on several of the homework uh, problems that a couple people did that. So just be careful. These programs, as, as helpful as this is, this ease program, most of you are getting used to it. It's a, sometimes a little cumbersome and slow, but it sure pulls up these values and sure plots them quickly once you get good at it. But it's still just a stupid computer program. It's only going to do exactly what you tell it to do. So don't tell it to do anything stupid. Tell it that that's your job. Okay. Back to work here. All right, we've got uh, a couple things going here. We've been working on op open systems this chapter. Now, uh, anything we did with closed systems still applied. We're still subject to the conservation laws that we've had so far. But they take a little bit uh, more complete form um, in, in the form in which we use them now. Um, for open systems, we can certainly have mass coming in. And the difference between the mass that comes in and the mass that comes out will tell us if the mass in the system itself is changing. Now, that wasn't even a concern with closed systems because mass couldn't go in or out. So that all of those were identically zero and never even came up. If you want the flow version of this, then it's m dot in minus m dot out equals the time rate of change, not of energy, but of mass in the system. And so that's our, our flow rate version of the uh, conservation of mass law. Uh, remember why we use the dot here notation and not the dot notation here? It's not, uh, it's not something I'll count off for, but it does help emphasize there's really a difference between what's on the right hand side and what's going on, on the left hand side and why do I, we don't use the dot notation over here. Uh, not quite. It's one left or directional and one on the right is quantity. Yeah. These are actual quantities flowing. This is not a quantity flowing, it's just a quantity that's changing with time. It's the mass in the system that may be increasing if we're filling the system, maybe decreasing if we're emptying the system. But for our steady flow assumptions, which are uh, I don't think we'll do anything else. I don't think we'll really have time to get to transient situations where we are actually filling a system or emptying a system, uh, meaning just simply there's a, a numerical difference between what's going in and what's going out. For our steady flow systems, what that means is for whatever our control volume is, for whatever our control volume is, as mass flows into the system, does whatever it does, and then flows back out, and it may occur through multiple inlets and or outlets. As this mass is flowing through there, a particular little piece of mass, its properties could very well change as it progresses through the system. It might come in 
quite, that little piece of mass might come in quite cold, be heated up because of heat addition or whatever else might be going on and come out quite warm and or much faster and or much lower or something. So uh, the, the properties on a particular little piece of mass that flows through the system are definitely going to change as it goes through the system. However, if we look at any one point and watch all the mass that goes past there, all the mass that passes that point has the same properties. Every piece of mass that goes past there is the same temperature as the ones that came by hours before. Every one has the same specific volume. The pressure is always the same at that point. That's our steady flow assumption. There's a little bit more to the steady flow assumption. We're not even, uh, I, don't, I don't remember even seeing it in our book, at least not yet. And that's that as we look at flow through a particular pipe, Oh, and by the way, you engineering students, this is not the engineering sketch for a pipe. We have to add that little bit there. So now we've got a pipe. So now things can flow through a pipe. Things can't throw, flow through solid bars. That's just dumb. I thought the pipe was just the thickness of the chopper. No. No. Much more realistic drawing. The non-engineering students, you can skip that. You know. you, you're going, what the hell is the... There's the, not the, engineering the, students in this class? Yeah, you're not an engineering major, are you? You are? Chemical engineering. What about uh, you? What are you doing? Chemical engineer. Oh. Well, welcome. <laughs> so I, I want you to do this too, then. It's a combo now. Yeah. yeah. Any, anybody not one of us? <laughs> okay, awesome. awesome. Anyway, the, the, the other assumption we're making, and like I said, I don't even remember if our book expresses this, we're also making the assumption that as something flows through a control volume, and that, that certainly is what a pipe is, we're assuming that uh, all the way across that particular point, and we've been using state point numbers for those as and to demark different places through there. We're assuming all the properties are the same across there. That the temperature down here as the mass flows by is the same as it is up there and the same as it is everywhere else. In reality, that's not true. Uh, one thing that happens as, as a mass flows through a pipe like this, it sticks to the walls a little bit and you'll actually have a velocity flow profile where the flow in the center of the pipe is much faster than it is at the edges of the pipe and in fact uh, actually sticks to the wall and there's zero velocity flow there. If those pipe walls are heated compared to the fluid then you'll have a temperature profile as well too where the flow near the walls will be more near the wall temperature and the temperature in the center will be more at some sort of previous temperatures because it hadn't had, a, had, hadn't had a chance to heat up from the walls yet. Um, we're just assuming that for the most part everything's the same across there and every number we use, even without expressing it, across that cross-section is uh, uh, constant all the way across there and is the average value as if the fluid was very very well mixed at every point which is not the reality of it but you don't need that until you get there if you ever do if you ever get into the design of this kind of, these kind of systems so for our steady flow assumption where the properties can change through the control volume, but at any one point they're always constant, then both of these are zero. Because if that wasn't true, then somewhere in the system mass is accumulating and uh, we then wouldn't have a steady flow assumption. So that's our, that's our conservation of mass law as we've been using it. 
where for the most part we get down to the point that what flows in must flow out even if it's only some time later and with very, very different properties. Our energy equation, and that's one we worked on uh, last Friday, looks a little more like this, that any heat, that the net heat transfer in minus the net work going out must be reflected in the fact that there is change in uh, there's there's some kind of difference uh, well, let me do it this way first that will, uh, will cause the energy of the system to change. Um, well, 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 let's, uh, let's, let's step to there. In chalk. Or just wait, like I do. Yeah, just wait. The, the trouble is every book uses a slightly different notation. Some books are fine with this being m dot, some aren't. Some don't like the dot notation at all. That's very rare. Okay, so the energy in minus the energy coming out will cause a change in energy of the system. But then, uh, oh, in, in flow rate form, we can have energy flowing in. And that will cause a time rate of change of energy in the system. Uh, that's just like we had over here before. And we can then throw in our uh, steady flow assumption. Then that means that the total energy of the system will not change. Will it still be a uppercase E? Yeah, because yeah, I, I haven't in any way pulled out the mass yet. Yeah. Uh, if I wanted to do that, then it would be m dot E in minus m dot E uh, out. And of course, that can apply for multiple inlets and multiple outlets if, if there are such. So for our steady flow assumptions, then we have for uh, open systems in, I guess, a more complete form, we have uh, all of the inlet mass coming in, however many inlets there might be, and uh, we'll have a problem today where uh, there are multiple of such. And then we have all the mass, mass flowing out. Uh, and then the full energy form for steady state steady flow, that will be the one where we got the Q minus W. will be a matter of a difference between all of the mass uh, flowing out minus the mass flowing in. And that's just the in minus out, the E part of it moved over to the other side, so that's why the orders change between the in and the out part. But then we know that now to be H plus the kinetic energy plus the uh, potential energy. 
at each of the outlets, and those might be different. You'd have to evaluate every outlet differently. And then the same kind of thing across all the uh, available inlets. And then if we do that in terms of the intensive properties, divide through by the m dot, and we get one more form through it. Then it's just the low, oh, sorry. We have flow rates. These have to have dots over them. That doesn't require any erasing. No. Flow rates over these because now we're dividing through by the m dots, and so now we're talking about steady state, uh, steady, uh, steady values as the m dot gets divided out, and then we get just delta h plus one half delta v squared. It's the change in the quantity v squared, not the change in and V, and then that squared. I predict two people. Phil volunteers to be one of those people to do that. And then uh, G delta Z. And often uh, either or both of those last ones are zero. And don't forget this H is the internal energy plus the flow work being done at that point. And so we combine those as a matter of uh, convenience. So these work terms here do not contain the flow work. There are all other forms of work that we've talked about. Pistons, paddle wheels, heaters, uh, electrical heaters, I don't think we have anything else like that. We don't uh, we don't do any work by friction in here. Uh, we'll talk about it briefly, but we don't we don't really do it. Okay. So some of the systems, open systems that we'll look at now, are nozzles and diffusers. They're really the same thing uh, for our fundamental purposes. They're the same thing, just turned around backwards. The, the main point of these is to change the speed of the flow, just like the nozzle on your garden hose. Well, you, you guys never help out your parents in the yard because you're doing homework for me. But all the nozzle at the end of that does is, is cause the speed to increase a diffuser is essentially that backwards so that the flow rate the, the speed at which the flow is moving will be reduced so certainly these take into account an awful lot of the uh, kinetic energy change typically they're so small and things through them are happening so quickly for the most part we consider these to be very well insulated which automatically makes the heat transfer during a transit through a diffuser to be to be zero so we'll look at a, a couple of those as we get to them um, we'll look at turbines both uh, Gas, steam, and liquid turbines. We won't do it much with liquid turbines. Most of what we'll do is, is uh, steam and gas turbines. Generally, these are to take high energy inlet air or, or fluid, use that energy to turn the shaft which is then connected to 
some other purpose. Often an electrical generator this is just what goes on in power plants. And it does it by having multiple I hear that backwards. So we're going to change this. This is a compressor. I need to teach this one once every four years. So when you guys take it again next year, it'll be better. In this case, then in this case, we have work actually being done on the shaft, which then takes the inlet air, progresses it through the compressor so that it becomes very high pressure, high energy air, and then outlets in uh, in that way. So it's it's the main purpose of it is to uh, greatly increase the pressure uh, of the fluid. We'll also work with pumps, which are very much the same. It's just they work on liquids, whereas compressors work on gas. But it's still the point of those to increase the pressure of the uh, fluid. And they do so by Connecting the impellers such that uh, work is being done on the on the fluid. Now we'll look at turbines. They're essentially compressors run the other direction. So it was easier to change the word than the drawing. Now we have high energy air uh, or steam or gas coming in hits the blades that are on the shaft causing it to lose a lot of its energy it tends to expand a lot its volume increases which is why turbines have to get bigger at the end and that will cause the shaft then to turn producing work out of the system and then the uh, low energy fluid is, is taken off and either returned back through the cycle to get it re-energized by running it through a boiler or uh, just uh, 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 evacuate the atmosphere. It's expanding because the because of uh, the lowering of pressure as it comes out of the pipe, right? Not just lowering the pressure, lowering of, of, of the other energy terms as well. But pressure is mostly it. All right, we'll also look at heat exchangers. which come in uh, a couple forms just to make the diagram simple it can often be that a hot stream goes through and heats up a cold stream without any exchange of mass between the two, just merely the transfer of heat from one to the other. And this is exactly what happens in your, uh, in your furnace at home. Uh, the hot combustion gases heat the air going through the ducts, but the combustion gases are not actually introduced into the uh, ducts, which is good because then it wouldn't, doesn't put carbon monoxide into the house. Other type of heaters we can use is where the fluid streams actually mix. There's, there's, that's what they look like when they mix. And a single stream comes out 
at a temperature somewhere, uh, conditions somewhere between the two. What's the we're, we're, I guess that's kind of what happens if you have uh, electric baseboard heaters in a way, where the air being heated uh, at the heater gets mixed with the ambient air, and something in between comes out. Do you have an in between color? I do. It's green, and uh, I don't know. What I need is a bright red and a blue, and then a then a pink or a purple come out. But uh, I probably have purple. Probably mix your pink and blue, and, and bring it. We'll make a mixed color. You ever thought about that? You have a little palette over on the side of your. No, I'm fine with that. There you go. That look purpley enough mm -hmm. for everybody to like that. <laughs> so what I have to make. I have to make this, this gets warm, and this cools down. <laughs> it kind of works. So what are you doing though? I, I just test it. Use my photographic <laughs> memory to remember the colors. Yeah, you watch it. Alright, what else we got? Uh, um, the only other type, uh, main one we'll look at are what are called Throttles or throttling valves. These are usually simply constructions, uh, constrictions in a uh, a pipe or something that, uh, for the most part, just causes a big pressure reduction. So, because of that constriction, uh, the pressure is greatly reduced. These of all the open systems will you'll see will probably come to be your favorite as we work through these. Actually, I can show you why. No big deal. The uh, conservation looks like uh, something like this. Well, since we're doing open systems. standard form of our conservation law. In fact, for any of these, we can start from there and just reduce things as we go. For throttling valves, they're very small. There's very little that goes on in terms of heat transfer, so that'll be zero. There's no work being done. We don't have any paddles or boundary changes or any of those things, so that's zero. From uh, somewhere before to somewhere after the valve, it's true that the two velocities are for the most part the same. Right in the valve, that's not true, but then uh, that's not the purpose of the valve. The valve is to change fluid in one place to uh, a situation somewhere later. They're generally very small, so there's not going to be any change in potential energies. Oops, and in right there. And if we're working at steady state, those masses are the same. Well, we're already in the steady state form, steady flow form of the equation. So for throttling valves, the Conservation energy comes down to there's no enthalpy change, which makes it very easy as we use, as we calculate those as we go through. Not as easy for the other ones since there is work interchange, there might be heat transfer interchange, uh, but we'll work through examples of all of these as we go. Sweet, that would be using like turning something into a vest to be fired or something. Uh, no, not 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 really. Where we use it is in uh, uh, refrigerator systems, where you just simply want a big pressure drop, because then that changes the boiling point and allows you to 
take heat from very cold places and release the heat to much warmer places, which is not what heat likes to do. Heat likes to go the other way for the refrigeration systems get that to turn around. One of the components of that is a throttling, a throttle lap. Uh, it's also true that's exactly what uh, a faucet and a pipe does as well to the act as throttling valves. Though that's not necessarily their purpose. Their purpose is to <laughs> shut the flow off. So shut the flow off. All right, so let's let's do CFO. Start, yeah. Start working through a couple of these <laughs> now. Some of these. Do you want to take a minute and text that to somebody? That's CFO. Uh, some of these we'll look at now where are actually homework problems, so it'll help you have a little bit better spring break because we can eliminate a problem or two. Um, like we'll look at, at problem in the in the English books. It's uh, or in the, uh, the U.S. version. It's problem five fourteen. In the international, it's six five six. Unless. I screwed up those. Am I getting those numbers okay? Is you, you, you check between each other who has different books, and, or you don't care? Is it, it's easier to copy if you're copying the same problem, isn't it? You look at me when I'm accusing you of things. <laughs> you look away. All right, and that problem: a water pump, a water pump in, increases the water pressure, and we're given a couple. Things the diameters of the inlet opening and exits are given. Oh, what now? Oh, man, I'm glad you're not on tape, Alan. Oh, sure, no. Thanks. Sure, Dave. Sure. Thanks. <laughs> Oh, there, you go. there are holes in yeah, your shirt show. now. <laughs> <laughs> Supply work to this, turning the impeller, which will then increase the, the pressure of the system. So let's see what we're told here. steady flow conditions 
um, were to find the speed at the inlet and the speed at the outlet. things we have to assume, and we don't normally need to say those, but it doesn't hurt as we get going here on some of these. Um, yes, sir. Uh, that's D2 on the right thing. Huh? You got D1 written twice. Oh, sorry. D2. Uh, we'll assume that it's running a steady flow. So we're not just at the point of turning this on. It's been running... Um, such that uh, we're uh, assuming constant uh, situation throughout. Um, might want to check what the state of the water is going in. Is, is it uh, most likely it's just water, that's what pumps do, but it doesn't hurt to check real quick. So, how do you do that? That's right. You pull out your tables, you turn on your projector at home, and check what? Just to make sure where the inlet conditions are so you know what you've got going in. Especially since we need the specific volume, because that's going to determine a lot about what the mass flow or the, the velocity flow rate is. If you look at the pressure table at 70, 70 kPa, ah, we don't quite have it, we have 75, but you see the temp saturation temperature is up near 100. We're way down at 15 degrees. 15 degrees doesn't even register until very, very low pressures. So we're, we're most definitely in compressed liquid. Could have pretty much assumed that since we had a pump anyway, but it's, uh, it's nice to check it. Um, so the velocity, the speed, um, the only thing we have, do we have the mass flow rate? Sorry, we do have the mass flow rate as uh, 4 kilograms a second, no, sorry, 0.5 kilograms a second. And one of the things you should be remembering by now that relates that mass flow rate to the speed of the flow is m dot equals rho VA. Nice little tattoo if you're looking for one over the break. Might be a nice one to get. Just a, just a the one right there, maybe. We don't often work with density, so uh, we put it in terms of specific volume, which remember is just the inverse of the density. And if we ever need it, the speed times the cross-sectional area is the volumetric flow rate. So uh, all of those are always available to us. Well, for the inlet, we do know that um, the M dot's given V we can find, we now know something about the state point, we just have to figure out just what the numbers we're going to use and look them up. And the uh, flow area, we, we don't have directly, but we know what the diameter is, so we can find that. 
So the only other piece we need is what is the specific volume of the fluid. And that we can find from the tables. First thing to check is the compressed liquid tables. Compressed liquid tables, the, the smallest they even go down is 5 megapascals, and we're, we're quite a bit under that. Um, plus the, the temperatures, temperatures that we've got are all pretty low, but you notice that these values don't change terribly. You're not going to go too wrong with whichever one you happen to pull out. We can just double check what's at the very left side of the dome by looking at the pressure, saturated water pressure tables. We did have 70 kilopascals, 0.00137. If we look at the temperature tables, what are where we are at saturation? 0.00101. So things aren't, things don't change very much in the water. It's uh, for the most part incompressible. So just take one of the values since we're here and that's that's a pretty looking one. Looks like a binary number. We'll take that one. And that'll be good enough because things don't change much. If you need better information then uh, you can go to, uh, I'll tell you where to go. You can go to um, the, uh, you can go to these, just put in that temperature and pressure and use the volume that comes up. So that's the easy way to find V1. And then, uh, how do you find V2? The velocity at the exit.
Okay. So let's see another one. Problem 522 is the same kind of thing that a pump does, raises the pressure, but does so on air. So that's the number in the English and the American model of 20 in the uh, international. We have a compressor that is um, Causing a big increase in the in the airflow. Quick work being done on the system. What? Oh. Thought I missed something up again. Okay, we want to find that work being done. It's actually the flow work. It's the work being done to force the flow through the through the system. Uh, one megapascal
So it doesn't have specific volume in here. It has V sub R, but there's no units with it. And it has units on everything else, well, except PR. And then there's even some new stuff. We don't know what S not is. Huh? Well, it's a good question. But maybe there's an easier thing to do. Here's one there. Nope, I guess not. Well, it's on the hard one. You think about it easier. You try using ease, but you know, maybe this is at a, a traffic stop and the cop says, if you can answer this question, I won't write you a ticket. Now you'd be interested in that. Just a little question about ease. How do you make you calculate um, uh, specific heat at a constant pressure, specific heat at a constant volume for a certain temperature? Is there some function to that, or do you yeah. just have to... Yeah, it's one of the thermodynamic properties that's right in there. How do you do that? I tried that. I couldn't find what letter is that assigned to. I think you just put CP. CP? I, I forget. You just, you uh, you know, you give it a variable name, maybe C sub P, yep. and then the call is, I think, just CP. Yep. And then you say what fluid it is, air, and then you give it whatever two intensive right. independent properties you've got. Because the, uh, the chapter four homework has you finding CP by, and if you want to do the problem easy, they only give you T, they do not give you anything else. So what were they assuming you look up, just the room temperature CP? Uh, well, we have temperature tables for CP in terms of the, uh, that, that polynomial. Right, right. My, my question is, how do you do that at ease when they only give you temperature, and that's it, nothing else? Uh, it, it might be one that just runs on temperature. I don't know offhand. I just don't remember. Okay. Full of CCP and ease. Ratios. Uh, well, Sons ratio, right? No. Poisson ratios for something else. <laughs> are, are, we, are we on this? Poisson's ratio, uh, the specific heat ratio? Yeah. What about it? It's called P sub R. We can use it. We can dismantle that together. For this problem or his problem? Your problem. I don't care what you call <laughs> <laughs> Well, don't forget that air is an ideal gas. And for ideal gases, PV equals well, depending on which V we've got there, but, and those are just given, and so it's a, a very straightforward problem to define the flow work. Remember, that's only part of the, uh, the work we've got there, and that flow work is usually part of the uh, enthalpy. Maybe we call this control law. We're just looking for the lower of this one. All right. Uh, a turbine problem, I'll give you. This isn't one of the homework ones, so. Uh, Cup luck. Okay, Alan introduced this new. Idea of I don't care what you're doing. Remember, turbines are to extract energy from the fluid and turn it into work. So we've got uh, thirty-two hundred kilowatts coming out. Inlet conditions, again, this is air. Um, P1 is uh, 
10 bar. Uh-oh. That sucks. T1 equals 900K. Well, that's what you get, Alan, for making me mad. And uh, at the outlet, pressure is greatly reduced. Temperature quite a bit reduced. Pretty typical. And the outlet velocity is uh, 100 meters per second. And is much, 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 uh, that's much greater than, than V1 is. Now wait a second. <laughs> huh. Oops, wrong V's. Yeah. What? That's what I was going to say. That's happening. Remember, those are my physics velocity V's. What that means is that the the, the, uh, the air it's pulling in is uh, is from a, a large reservoir somehow, but it's very very high temperature and high pressure. Just its velocity isn't all that great. Could also be that the the inlet um, areas are very very large, keeping the velocity down. Okay, we want to find the mass flow rate and the exit area. Yep, that's all we need. is going to come from our energy balance for constant conditions, steady flow conditions. Which we can rearrange to some form something like that for steady state conditions. If we can get enough of those things, then we'll be able to find the M dot there because uh, there it is. Right there. Transfer zero, either to or from the turbine. Might or might not be, but we don't have anything here that's going to help us with that. We've got this. Uh, we're looking for that. Those 
that kind of thing we can come up with. This kind of thing we've got information about. Well, that we can assume is zero, since there's certainly no altitude difference given between the inlet and the outlet, which is, for gas turbines, pretty true. They're not that big. Uh, the type of turbines, hydraulic turbines they have in the dam, that's not true. So we have enough stuff to deal with that one. Um, we can deal with that one. We're looking that up. We're given that one. We don't have anything about this. So we're going to have to assume it's a well insulated or rather small turbine. Because we just don't have anything more about it. It may have even said in the problem that it was an insulated uh, turbine. So that we're given. This, uh, well, we have an assumption about this that we can use. Uh, maybe not an assumption, or a comparison between the two. So if we can find this, then that's all we need. So. Can we find H2 and H1? That it's much, much. Did I draw that the wrong way? Yeah. That's why it's less. Sorry, I was looking not only at the international edition, the Australian edition, where everything's backwards. Must work in Australia. So, just saying the inlet velocity is negligible. So, where can we find that? So that that's that you can work on for a bit here. that we were talking about last week. How to find the changes in the enthalpy. Sound familiar? Any more than I said there? Yeah, there's an H right there. Does that help us? Now, we do have the air tables, table A17, the one we happen to be on, it's got enthalpy in it um, in terms of temperature though, not pressure. But if you remember, I told you that uh, enthalpy is much, much more strongly dependent upon temperature than pressure. So uh, the temperature is in degrees Kelvin. There's H, that would be H at 500, that's H2, 50302, and H1 at 900K. Oh, it's two columns. Yeah. 932 93. Right? 932 93. So there's delta H. We can find then the, uh, the exit velocity and use that then to find the the uh, flow area. Oh, kind of, because we're still going to need uh, at the exit. B2, A2. What are you getting at? 932. At 900 <coughs> degrees? I 
have to be on the air too. I'm in the water. I'm in the water too. Okay. I've done this before. Well, you can try that if you want. I've done it. I think I've tried it before. It doesn't work. Yeah, be careful with that. There's a lot of tables. We have more to come. Is there a quicker way to do that? That's pretty quick. But if you don't have the tables, or you're in the wrong tables, use ease. Or yes. Don't guess. Yes. Yeah, there we go. What we want is quick. delta H. Is there a way to get a pretty good number for that? Huh? Yeah, we did this the other day. CP delta T. If uh, you can come up with an appropriate delta T, maybe you don't have the air tables, but maybe you have uh, CCP tables, or just have to remember that number. So do it both ways. Not a big deal. Let's compare them and see how how much difference we get with the delta H figured one way and the delta H figured the other. So air not on that table. Common liquids and foods. Air is not a food unless you're a breatharian. You guys heard about breatharians? Here's CCP for air on table A2 as a function of temperature. And so we're talking about what? 500 and 900. 1.029 and 1.121. So about halfway in between there, 1.07 might do it. halfway in between the 500 and the 900 temperatures that we have. So halfway in between there is about 1.07, is that about right? Again, this is table A2. One 1.075, that's the one that makes you happy? And then the delta T is uh, well, minus 400. Minus because the enthalpy is dropping. The enthalpy is going in part to this work. So what's that one come out to be? And what's this one come out to be? On the right, All right. And this one? It's like 429. Negative 429.9. So, not very much difference. Pretty darn. 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 Pretty Not a huge difference between the two. And so we can find then a mass flow rate, just putting in the numbers, finishing it up, you get a mass flow rate of something like 7.5 kilograms per second. Just solid for M dot here and watching your units. And then the last part of it, we're asked to find, find the outlet area. Now we have M dot. We know the velocity. We don't know the specific volume at the exit. How can we find that? Huh? Yeah, you, 
an ideal gas. It's an air turbine. Use uh, use the ideal gas law. We've got the pressure and the temperature at the outlet, and so you can find the specific volume. And you can do that, and I can go to lunch. I'll just sit here and do that. Nothing more, well, you need R, but I think we already even had that once in the table right before for air. 287. Again, no. If we were doing this in ease, how could we make ease find R for us? Um, well, one way you can do it is uh, R equals C sub P minus C sub B. And you can, oh, do we have the right tables to show that? C sub P minus C sub B is about 0.3 and R is yeah about 0.3 so just look at the rough numbers that about works so that's one way to do it since it can call up those uh, if not it doesn't I don't think it has this for air specifically but it does have the universal gas constant for air and it might even have the molecular weight for air and so you can get the specific gas constant uh, that way Because uh, what do we call the universal gas constant is R U. That's on a per mole basis, and then R is on a kilogram basis. So is that right? That way, the units will tell you that that's right. Now. So you can get it. You can look up the universal gas constant with P's. I know. I just don't think it has the specific. Uh, one for a particular gas. Okay. Other questions?